Hello, it's Boyd from Air Boyd, and we are up here in the UP in Menominee, and we're visiting the Enstrom Helicopter Factory today. We're going to get a behind-the-scenes tour with President and CEO Todd Tetzlaff. Hey, thanks for coming, Boyd. Glad you're here. I am really looking forward to showing you around. Let's go. So remind me again how Enstrom ended up here. Enstrom started uh, with its namesake, Rudy, Rudy Enstrom, back in the er, early mid-40s. Rudy was a mining engineer up in Crystal Falls, Michigan, about two hours from here, two and a half. Um, he was a mining engineer, and he decided he wanted to build a helicopter. And uh, he worked on it for over a dozen years. By the late 50s, he had something that would fly, uh, just short, short little hovers. Uh, but his design had merit, and it was noticed. It was noticed by businessmen here in Menominee, Michigan, um, who attracted him to relocate here and incorporate as the, the Enstrom Helicopter Corporation. That was 1959. Um, a team of engineers was recruited, um, some from throughout the aircraft industry, some local. And uh, by 1965, they had their first certified model, the F-28. And hand built here ever since. Everything yes, they built have. on the property here, out back, designed, engineered, everything. It is. Yep. Uh, but what's unique is many manufacturers uh, assemble assemble components that are are manufactured and formed and, and uh, cut elsewhere. We do well over ninety percent of that fabrication right here in house. So we fabricate, we assemble, um, we test, and we fly. So raw materials in one door, helicopters out the other door. Yep. All right, you've got a hallway of history we can go take a look at uh, on the way to the factory. Sounds good. Entered through our front door and um, looking at some of the earlier products, you'll notice this one, and that's Rudy Enstrom right here, uh, and a couple of the other investors, uh, local uh, businessmen who brought the company here. You'll notice a difference here. As we're going to talk about later, we have a unique design with the main rotor shaft being uh, kind of exposed to the elements without control tubes or supports. This is one of um, uh, Rudy Enstrom's earliest designs here in Menominee. Notice the two-bladed rotor versus the three, which is a characteristic of all of our helicopters today. And the control rods are, are more typical of what you'd see with other brands. But there were many design iterations. Here you now see three-bladed system, no supports. And uh, this again was going through that, that phase between 1959 and 65. Um, early 60s as you're going through the R&D phase. And is the three blade again for simplicity is just design choices? Three bladed, um, there's many nuances. You'll see a two bladed design is typically known as underslung uh, or a teetering rotor head. So blades flap, blades lead and leg. Those types of designs typically do it in unison as one blade goes down, one goes up. A fully articulated system uh, has hinges there, which are offset off the center of the of the main rotor shaft. Provides a little different feel to to how the helicopter um, is controlled. Uh, a little more control. Uh, I'll get into the aerodynamic and dynamic nuances. I don't want to misspeak, but there's control power, there's control authority. Uh, there's a little bit of difference there. So each blade is free to do what it wants to do. So it isn't dependent, uh, like I said, a teetering system. Um, one blade goes up, the other goes down. This one, each blade can follow its path as it circles above you. Um, common design, Sikorsky does the same. Um, many of your, all of your multi-blade rotors behave the same. However, the newer designs have gone to hingeless. They have flexible beams in there that take up that flap and lead leg motion. Ours is traditional and uses hinges. You're looking at the first building uh, of the Enstrom Helicopter Corporation back in 1959, 60 time period. Um, right there housed everything. Everything from accounting to engineering and design uh, to R&D. Um, so not very big. Uh, back in the day, um, the, the, as we go through some of these pictures, you're going to see where this building was swallowed up by some of the structures we have today. Seems like it's rainy um, that day too. A little rainy, yes. In this picture, you see 1964, that original building is right here. Where we are standing right now is, is right here. <laughs> and uh, uh, the building has gone towards the street, uh, also has gone north. Uh, you'll see where uh, we've got much of 
newer facility, newer uh, machining centers, and different back shops that help produce our helicopter. Again, groundbreaking ceremony back in the early, uh, in 59. One of our more notorious owners was F. Lee Bailey uh, from 72, I think, to 1980. He was the owner of this company. Um, and it was also the heyday, the heyday. The 70s were pretty good for general aviation to begin with. And uh, uh, think Cessna, think, think, think Piper Beach, all those household names in the fixed wing world. This is when we see those videos where the businessman was supposed to go buy an airplane yes. and fly himself to work every day. Yes. But it was also a boom time for the helicopter industry. So at one year, we produced over 100 helicopters out of this factory. Um, but in the numbers in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were not unheard of. Um, and that's really where we're headed today. Right now, we're looking to be in that 40 to 50 helicopter range as we are under new ownership as of uh, just going on two and a half years ago. Uh, fully American owned and we're building up to like I said 40 to 50 per year again um, yeah it shows another this is what it looked like in the 80s to early 90s this is an addition not much here. different when I visited no that's right time. your first time here was 1993 and um, had grown here in this direction and have a paint shop also associated with it and storage facilities in uh, 2014 uh, the next uh, big uh, expansion occurred and it more than doubled the size. We're up to 173,000 square feet. So again, looking from a different perspective, um, this is the building we are currently in. The original building had been right in this area. Like I said, it got swallowed up. We had grown this way north on different occasions. And then this expansion as well, which houses our uh, final assembly and flight line, uh, part 145 repair station. And then this section here is other QA offices, avionics buildup, and engineering as well. All in-house. All in-house. And then the magic. Our version of Skunk, Skunk Works is our R&D center out here. And in one of my earlier stints here, I spent seven years uh, as a flight test engineer and pilot out there really getting to do all the fun stuff. And since working here back then, what are you doing today again? I'm back as the president and CEO. So that's a that's a pretty good climb from basic I basic entry level draftsman. Engineer, draftsman. I was a draftsman to the CEO of the company. It is uh, shocking. I still uh, hard to believe, but I'll say if anybody can if if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, but when you're passionate about the company, the product, and the people, um, it's uh, it makes it easy. Anyway, that's the crew. Uh, some of our leadership team. This is a company that's been in the, the smaller side for many years, right? Yes. We are more of a, a, a niche player within the industry, and we know that, and we're happy with that. That is a, a good position for us. We have a very loyal following of uh, very diehard Enstrom fans. Uh, we're a very safe helicopter. We're relatively simple, full mechanical controls, no hydraulics, uh, a, a Lycoming engine in our piston, a Rolls-Royce turbine in our turbine helicopter. Um, so it's a very honest machine. Having flown other other brands of different sizes, um, helicopters are very purpose-driven and functional, um, as is ours, but it's also built for the everyday pilot. Uh, very forgiving, very honest machine. Um, Chuck Surex, our current owner, he learned to fly in uh, an Enstrom helicopter uh, 16 years ago. He decided he wanted to fly helicopters and he purchased one and uh, has been a fan of our product line ever since and when the opportunity arose for him to purchase he, he grabbed it. He is uh, an individual who's passionate about many things, uh, owns many many companies and is very active in what we do here. Um, he, is, he was here two weeks ago, he comes and visits us and participates in some of the air shows and... I made him an ally. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it isn't just another acquisition uh, that he looks at the, uh, the, the financials and that's it. He's very interested and passionate about the product. He's passionate about the people and very passionate about uh, building helicopters in the USA. One of the things you were talking a little bit about the competition earlier, uh, there is space for all these helicopter manufacturers because the helicopter industry is that small, right? It is, it is. Aviation, you and I are both aviation nuts. Uh, we love it. Uh, fixed wing, helicopters, you name it. 
it's a very small industry. You end up running into the same people over and over. Now take a fraction of that. That's the helicopter industry, and it is a family. It is a family. Even though we compete against each other, um, it's it's very tight knit. We're in touch with each other. We compare notes. Um, we cheer for everybody's success because there is room for everybody in this in this industry, and each provides a little different uh, way of approaching the vertical flight problem and challenges. And uh, again, we're in rarefied air. I think there's six six OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, FAA certified as uh, helicopter manufacturers, and that's six in the world. Wow. So here we are in Little Menominee, Michigan, doing some pretty cool things. So uh, continuing with the theme of the relative smallness of aviation, which I, I've known for a long time, but I was just at the Orange County Fire Authority's Firehawk uh, demonstration, and I met Ryan from Aerial Fire Mag, uh, and he had apparently been at the Anaheim show, and I'd not met him there. Uh, but he covers all over the world, and I just saw your map here, and this is everywhere that you have current products being used. It really, it, it is. There's, let me back up. There's nearly 1,400 that we've produced. Of those, there's nearly 800 still flying. This is our 65th year this year. So they are all over. This is dealers service centers and, and reps that we deal with. But indeed, throughout these countries is where Enstroms are flying. Um, we've got some other maps and the actual data um, I can get you later as well. But um, we just delivered uh, two to the Peruvian Army. We've got two more going to their Air Force. They've been long-term customers of us over the years. Um, and that's what's really nice too. We're still small enough where your pro our product support team knows many of our operators first name basis um, even though they may be dealing with a direct representative in a different country we're a phone call away uh, questions um, questions come here and the answers come from here because um, the the experts uh, reside here most of our product support folks spent time on the shop floor um, final flight line um, they know these helicopters like the back of their hand Oh, we do we do overhaul overhauls of uh, main rotor gearboxes, tail rotor gearbox, other components that come in for their the regular overhaul cycles. Um, some some entities and service centers that we qualify can do some of that as well, um, but really we do that right here within our Part One Forty Five repair station. And like all helicopter companies, you provide the same kind of military police support. Um, hang things off the outside. We do, we do. Um, we are a wonderful trainer. Um, we're a personal use aircraft as well. Get you to and from that golf course or to and from work. Civilian training and military training have really been fantastic for us. We have many fleets out there. Um, uh, 20 some still in Japan. Uh, Peru uses them as trainers. Pakistan. Um, Indonesia had a dozen two dozen all, all for their national police uh, years ago. Um, so from a training aspect, it's a great helicopter. From a police standpoint, it's a great helicopter. Like you said, we can put um, infrared cameras, uh, gyro-stabilized cameras, uh, searchlights. Uh, we do uh, a hook system, so we can do long line work as well. Um, very capable and uh, flexible platform. As you've already told me, the, the fire in the factory is where the materials come in. Everything is kind of done here in the middle, and the final product goes out the flight line right down here. Correct. You've got two different models sitting here. Uh, on the right, you said, was the, the Recip? That is the Recip, the 280FX right there um, with the Lycoming engine. And then on the left side is our turbine production line. That's the 480B. Here's a, here's a fuel tank. Yep, that's a piston fuel tank with a crash-resistant uh, bladder inside. So these are over here getting ready to be fitted with floors, glass, all the things that start to get this turned into a yeah. fully functioning helicopter. As we're kind of coming down the line towards the end, you'll see as we head back how the, it's a modular design. I'll point out this steel tube structure, all welded, is really the rib cage of the, of the helicopter, the heart. Everything else um, builds off of this. The tail cone gets hung off the end um, with three hard points. The landing gear structure, again, attaches to this structure. 
and as well as the main rotor gearbox. And uh, the, the blades then eventually are attached to the top, as is the floor keel structure, which is a combination of traditional built-up aluminum structure. It houses much of the control tubes for the control system um, with its floorboard here, and then the uh, fiberglass pan uh, cockpit structure. Now, when I sat in one of these in Anaheim, I was amazed at the visibility out the front. Uh, that was the, the turbo model. Yes. Uh, you actually make your own glass. We do. We do. It is uh, formed right here. Uh, I believe it's acrylic uh, sheets that come in, and it needs to be... You can do a flat wrap um, just along one, one um, radius, but that isn't stiff. It also doesn't look that great. So we actually form this in multiple planes, provides much more stiffness, gives it that little bit of a bubble look, and uh, it is a very laborious process. We have the oven, which is behind us here. Those sheets um, are heated and then quickly run out on that um, trapeze, whatever, whatever we would want to call it, comes out and numerous individuals, up to 10 people come in and put it over these forms and literally use muscle power while that uh, while sheet hot. is hot and get it in place and hold it. Hold it until it cools to get the right shape. Our glass is uh, clear, durable, no distortion, um, and again, done right here. I think I mentioned earlier, many companies assemble things. We fabricate and assemble things here, a vast majority of the whole end product. The, obviously the machine shop, so all the different skills it takes to build this complex product. This, this is fiber, well, wow, it's, it's quite light. It is. I, I can almost pick the whole thing up one-handed, mm -hmm. so that's, but incredibly strong. It is. And then these are the parts as they're coming together. So there's, there's the main frame there you talked about. Yep, this is the keel, four keel structure. So this is actually upside down. Yep. You'll see this is the beginning of the, of the uh, instrument panel, instrument console. Um, but again, traditional sheet metal structure, um, riveted. Um, you've got the honeycomb panel here for the floor, but it houses quite a bit of the, the uh, controls as well. You've got your collective control tube and then also your cyclic control tube uh, here. And it's just the same kind of manufacturing techniques that aluminum planes would be made with forever. Yep. 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 In the helicopter style. Yes. Here's this the, is what the, the welded yep. this is tubing the looks pylon. like after it's being cleaned up and painted. Yes. Yep. This is a, for the turbine. The turbine engine uh, is mounted in this area. Um, the turbine engine is very powerful, very light. Um, and that fits, nestles in here. You got the four bolts here where you'll see the main rotor transmission gets mounted to. This keel structure gets mounted at these four points here off the front and obviously landing here below. And then the, the part that is common, like you said, common to fixed wing and rotary wing is that tail cone. A true semi-monocoque structure, very similar to your general aviation aircraft, Cessna, Piper, um, Beechcraft. Part of our raw stock, our raw stock is stored here, comes in, um, goes into the machine shop, which is just ahead of us. But depending on what components being built, we really just lop off a section here. If you're gonna make a control part or what have you of this raw stock comes through, you'll see some of the completed parts as we walk through. Um, this is where it starts. This is the beginnings of a helicopter. And I mean, all the, all the hand presses and things that I see lying around here, everything you would have found in just a regular high school. Yep, uh, we have metal some shop of those, those traditional manual um, tools and, and machines to help form the parts. There's still a lot of craftsmanship involved. We're trying to automate more um, just so we have that precision and repeatability uh, and efficiency so we can actually produce at a very high rate, um, which is the goal. This is a selection of some of the things that are processed out of here. That is correct. Yep. Pretty much from the very simple and mundane, we have an instrument panel, 
uh, cutouts to some pretty intricate uh, detailed uh, control system parts. Sheet metal department for placing the correct radius bends and, and uh, angles that they need for the various parts. The, this is where all the fiberglass comes yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so this is how it starts? This is the mold and then... That's the cabin mold, yeah. It's one of the stages of it. There's a few stages it goes through. Yeah, that's actually the bonding fixture once it's all laid up. Yeah, we put doublers on the inside, bond them in. We have a routing fixture, a layup fixture, a bonding fixture. That's some of the, the doublers Tom's talking about yeah. there. Yeah. So that gives you the stiffness for that cabin. And, it, and that's why it's light yet strong. Yes. How long does it take to put together one cabin? Well, the, lay, the layup is probably about 16 hours, and then the doublers are probably a couple hours a piece for the entire process because you got to gel coat them and then lay them up and then trim them. Then they come together and bonding them is probably maybe six to eight hours. So it's relatively quick. Yeah. And that's where we saw the, the box outside, right? Like yep. The floor box. Oh, back walls and floors. Yeah, that's a back wall over there. They wrote them on the CNC table, and we come in, or they come in here, and we pot them. Pot the outside, and then pot all the, all the different inserts and stuff in. Yeah, this is a turbine vertical stabilizer. It's the same honeycomb material, only it's carbon fiber. All these are built and designed in-house, too, all these jigs. The green and now the blue are going to be for the pistons. The yellow ones in the corner over there, that's for all the turbine pylons. And this is a, a recently welded frame? Yep. So what it looks like before it gets cleaned up and painted. So this is the blade shop. This is and the, the blade, blade shop. And the blade was one of the things that I saw in a cabinet on display in Anaheim. And it was this cross section. I was like, it's just a wing. And I think it a is. lot of people probably yeah. in their minds think of a blade as being sort of a, a solid part. Uh, when this is just basically an aluminum wing spinning around really fast and somehow magically held on by two bolts. Yep, really one bolt. One bolt is there to stabilize things. It's just to stabilize it. Yeah. That's but yeah, it's really in, in virtually, except, you know, you'll see the doublers and the fittings down here. It's really just three parts. It's an aluminum extrusion, which is indeed the leading edge of the, of the wing, of the blade, and two pieces of sheet metal. And it's all bonded. It's all bonded structure. The, the extrusions. These? The extrusions. Yep. And that's just the leading edge. Yep. Double sets the leading edge. Holds it onto and gives it. Yep. Strength. Yeah. This is really acts as the. It's the leading edge, so it's the front end of the airfoil, and it is also the spar. You know, we don't have a traditional spar like you would think in an aircraft airplane wing. Um, so this extrusion is the structure. Um, Doing multiple duties. Yes. Yes. And then it's just the two. The two pieces of sheet metal then again this is the bond line here and here so the sheet metal comes back follows that airfoil shape all the way along the length what do we have here we have one of our test aircraft here it's coming in it's going to have a, a overhauled engine put back in this is one of the precursors to our current product the 480b it started life as a th28 back in the early 90s um, we were in competition where the U.S. Army's new training helicopter competition. And uh, we were a very viable candidate, however, did not end up with that contract. And uh, it became a test bed for really everything you see here on the turbine line. And when I was out at that experimental R&D facility of ours, this is the helicopter I flew the most. And she may look a little dated, but this girl is my favorite of everything we've got and uh, anxious for her to get back in the air again. While we're in this room, there's a very clear view here of the shaft. Yes. This has got to be one of the things that Enstrom is known for. What is unique is that all helicopters have one. Some are covered by a fairing, some are shorter, uh, and that's based on whatever uh, the, the uniqueness of each design. One thing, so every, well, let me rephrase that. Every helicopter has one. What is missing, or what you don't see, are the control rods. There's push-pull tubes uh, that actuate and change the pitch of the rotor blade. Again, all helicopters. 
those are usually external, and you see them spinning around. Ah, on, yes, I have on, seen them. You see, uh, uh, and you'll see little linkages and whatnot exposed because you'll see the shaft, you'll see the push-pull tubes, you may see a swash plate. You'll see a spinning and then a stationary um, control. Uh, looks like a, it could look like a star. It depends on how many blades you have, which puts the pitch into the blades. That is also missing. If you want to poke your camera down here, you will see where our swash plate is. And it is right here. So again, we're fully mechanical controls, no hydraulics. So I will move this for you. You're, we're on the cyclic uh, control push-pull tubes here. So up in here where this fitting is, that is the bottom end of the push-pull tube. And it goes all the way up that shaft. And as I mentioned, there's linkages up there then that impart so it changes. It's basically protected inside the tube. It is protected. Wire strikes, um, bird strikes. So this is lateral. This is left, right. Here's forward and aft. So even with its complexity, it's actually quite simple. It is. Uh, and left, right, forward aft, and then it just a dance around. So it's more than just cosmetics? It is. There is a purpose to it. And like you said, unique look. I do hear that comment a lot. I go, boy, it doesn't look like it's hanging from much, does it? Indeed, on this model, that shaft is roughly 36 pounds. It isn't a tube, it's a shaft. It's a machined shaft, very intricate, with splines on either end, different um, uh, areas for bearings and different tapers and diameter changes that are hidden from view. Um, very, very strong. In fact, one of the other well-known brands, the Bell, Bell 206, um, it has a shaft as well. Uh, it has those external control tubes, so people don't question what it looks like. They go, well, look, at there's, it's hanging from a lot. Indeed, that Bell shaft is smaller in diameter and thickness than this one. But again, like you said, there's uh, three feet exposed without anything around it. So it does look unique. The Enstrom design does look unique, but purpose-driven, very safe, very strong, and it protects the control system from the elements. And again, any wire strikes, bird strikes, prevents damage that way. Now going to what we call the glass, full glass, with the Garmin um, avionics and uh, also digital engine instrumentation system. Very compact, saves on wiring weight, saves on component weight, provides more visibility because that package is smaller, and it gives you all those, all everything that we're used to. Um, and I say used to from an automotive aspect. You, everything in your newer cars is uh, digital in screens. That is where we are. Does everyone wear two hats? Because you said you do a lot of flying as an engineer. Yeah, I started as a drafter, ended up a design engineer, um, became a flight test engineer, uh, had got, gained my rotary license uh, away from Enstrom, came back in uh, with a commercial, uh, gained a commercial rating, and became a test pilot as well. Um, so yes, many hats. Um, uh, but testing could be anything from just verifying the performance to doing some, some unique maneuvers. Um, and again, either as a pilot uh, for experimental work or production work. In the past, we have had dedicated test pilots um, of the different flavors of uh, maintenance and production test pilot um, or full experimental uh, test pilot. Um, currently, we share those duties, and I, not me, I'm not current anymore, but we have a product support expert who doubles as an AMP mechanic and a pilot, um, our VP of uh, quality and product support is also a commercial helicopter pilot. He does some production tests for us. Sales and, and marketing. Owner owns and flies. Yes, he does. Sales and marketing, we have a pilot on board. Um, one of our recent uh, retirees is still on board as a consultant. He is the full complement of all the FA test pilot skills and authorities. 
so we rely on him to help us out as well. We're going through some development on a very exciting new feature we're going to offer. It's going to have air conditioning. So, um, is, is that difficult to add to something like this? Uh, is it easier on a recip turbine? Does it make a difference? Oh, we're doing it on both, but we started with the with the recip here. Um, so it's in the R&D phase, it's already been flying. We had it at Oshkosh for the air show um, and it was plugged in and running and it was a very cool environment. So it was a good little test for it. And I assume um, it's a big customer requested item. Yes, yes it is. So no, the, the science behind air conditioning has been around for quite a while. Um, this is an electric uh, system um, with uh, working with Kelly Aerospace and they're, they're experts at it and the condensers in the tail going here, the evaporator um, and lines up front. So it is, it is going to be a very sought after feature. So the move away from Avgas, sort of on the horizon. Yes. Is the, is the turbine gonna take over? Is there still gonna be a place for the recip? Uh, are there countries gonna keep it? What do, you, what do you think the future looks like for we the are two lines? very active on the studies, the debate, and the activity surrounding Avgas and it going away. Um, there are many options. Um, there are different fuels being developed. Uh, we're in contact with various parties on what those fuels will look like, how they will behave, and uh, are definitely keeping abreast of that. In addition, um, some parts of the world, Avgas in its current form is difficult to find difficult to find or expensive. So we're already looking at variations and different options on where we can go. Um, will it continue to be Avgas driven? Will one of these fuels under development be viable for the Lycoming engine in our uh, installation TBD on those? Um, but there's diesel, there's electric, there's uh, other turbines. There's the very wide open right now on where we may go. So this is missing its body? Yeah, we got a pylon engine and landing gear married up here in the engine buildup area. So this would get assembled and any testing done before it's sent out? Or? Uh, nope, this is all buildup. This will then go into the sub-assembly area where um, that modular design comes in where the, the front structure, in this case it's a fully aluminum seating structure, the front cabin or cockpit area, and the tail cone will go on. And a standard light combing, there's no difference than you find anything else, or is it helicopter HIO specific? 360 F1AD, um, which is turbocharged. So right here we've got the turbocharger, so it maintains 225 horsepower up through, uh, up to altitude. So here, here's one of the, the newer ones, un unlike the one we saw with the round dials. This, this is a typical avionic stack that you get today. Mm -hmm. uh, bigger, clearer glass, more to see the outside. This one's got the blades on, and as you corrected me, it's really only held on by one big bolt. The other bolt's just there uh, for stability and moving things. Mm -hmm. And then we got a, just a very small shaft down the back to the other unique feature, which I've seen on other models, like what I call the, the MASH helicopter, the older bell, right? Yeah, yeah. This open tail. Yeah, our tail rotor is unobstructed, and it's very beneficial. Uh, one, it's light. Um, we do have the, we, we have all the features of other, another helicopter, or other helicopters. We have a horizontal stabilizer, and we have a vertical stabilizer, but they are forward of this tail rotor to allow the airflow to come through. Um, it's efficient. It, um, you've seen some, some where the vertical tail is right here. Um, they work well. There can be an issue with what they call uh, LTE, loss of tail rotor effectiveness. Certain wind azimuths and certain flight regimes, you can be asking more of a uh, pedal uh, to turn or to maintain direct flight. Um, and there's a disturbance in that airflow and you'll lose that effectiveness briefly. So that is not an issue with these helicopters at all. Um, this system right here is to one prevent somebody from you know walking into it obviously we've got the red paint as well um, but if you come in tail low say you're doing an engine out landing or what have you you may may touch the tarmac you may touch the grass this is to protect that tail rotor 
um, gives you a little bit of clearance down here. And then this, the Boinky bar, um, is positioned there to, uh, I've had people say, well, why didn't you put it vertically? Why, why, that looks like you did something wrong. I'm like, no, there's a science behind it. We actually did the testing, the static testing, where it absorbs the energy of a, of a small impact, but it also provides a little cushion. There's some spring out, out here that if this was right in line, vertical, would be too rigid and put a bit of a shock into the tail rotor system and the tail cone. So you can actually see some of that uh, the flex that are on the blades as you actually lift it up and down too. It's amazing how much of this moves yet is rigid. Yes. I'll scoot in front of you here. So we saw these in the machine shop before. Oh, that's right. Uh, yep. The nice shiny things. Mm -hmm. So, so again, uh, these are controlled with cables. Um, come through here with your tail rotor pedals, anti-torque pedal. So again, very all the moving parts. So you change the pitch of the blade. Yeah, it's balanced and has. Uh, the hinge system, I'm going to call it a Delta III. I will honestly admit if that is um, the true aerodynamic helicopter aero term. It's been a while. Angle to provide stability. So if you do have an imbalance in the airflow coming through, say there's more lift on one blade than the other, and it wants to go Na out of naturally. plane, go out of plane, it actually changes the angle of attack because of its hinge line and reduces the reduces the angle of attack on one blade and increases it on the other. So it's self-stabilizing. Wow. That's pretty clever. So th this is the turbine. This is the turbine. It's our latest and greatest instrument panel, full glass. Still five going seats. through. Yes, five seats. We're currently configured for three. Um, so um, you can have uh, the dual controls with a seat in the middle as well. This seat closest to us can actually move forward and inboard. You remove the controls and the rest of that bench seat folds down for two more seating positions. And it's quite a bit bigger than the, the Riso. Substantially bigger. There is a lot of elbow and headroom in, uh, in this model. Surprising amount of room. It's very good looking too. Thank if you. I might say. I, the, Thank the, you. There's something to it. That... She's got good lines. Piston is just crammed in there with all of its different components. You know, here's the turbine. Again, that the piston, 225 horsepower. This is rated for 420. We derate it to 305 for a five-minute rating and 287 for max continuous. Um, but you get all that horsepower in a much, much smaller package. I hardly take any space in there. That's amazing. It's basically, you've got all ventilation now. Mm-hmm. And again, this, the same shaft system, tubes in the middle and everything. Yes. What's a swirl tube? Ooh, a swirl tube. You'll see these on many turbine helicopters. It's a design that has been around for quite a while. Um, there's probably a fancier name, but I call them swirl tubes, and they are. Um, that actually draws the air in and rotates it. So through centrifugal force, any debris, sand, grit, dust, um, is shot outward. And then the stream of air, clean air, is then comes through the whole induction system. Wow, so self-cleaning. So you, you mentioned it a couple times, the, the blade guy mentioned it a couple times. So how often do wires hit helicopters? too often, you certainly want to avoid those wire catches. Um, you know, reading accident reports, you are in a low, generally in a very uh, low altitude environment, and that's where towers, wires, um, those types of things reside. So you have to be very wary. Um, so even in agricultural, fixed wing or rotary, you're working in a high risk, higher risk environment. So I don't have a number for you, but unfortunately you do see those um, but it's something you actually have attempted to engineer for. Yes, yes. You'll see some, uh, in fact, we've looked at them as well, but a wire strike protection system, which is a, a blade, uh, literally a blade that will catch that wire and cut it. 
sometimes there's uh, very large kites that people fly. I don't know what the material they use for, for some of their strings, but I've seen those wrapped up in the control tubes of other helicopters and it mashes them completely. Uh, so inst instead of mylar balloons and right. the lines, they're getting into right. helicopters. And too. we've had some of those too, and it, of course it gets wrapped up, but it doesn't damage anything. The control system stays intact. Are all of these pre-sold? Do you build them after someone buys them? We can do both. We can do both. Really, everything that we have in work here today, we're doing for specific customers. Uh, much of what you see here is being used for R&D purposes. Uh, we just delivered two to Peru, the Peru uh, Army. Two more are in work for the Peruvian Air Force. And we have more sales that we haven't announced yet, and domestic sales as well that we have announced. Um, but until we get through some of these programs, those deliveries will be later this year, likely into the new year as well.